our chief guest honor, chief guest of honor, Dr. Philippe Grandchon. Philippe Grandchon is a Danish scientist and is the head of the Environmental Medicine Research Unit at the, Un at the University of Southern Denmark and adjunct professor of environmental health at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. He is the co-director of a super fund research program called STEEP to study PFAS. He lives in Copenhagen, Denmark and in Cambridge, Massachusetts and travels widely to study environmental problems and to examine children whose lives have been affected by pollution, more specifically to environmental chemicals. He is the recipient the recipient of many awards like Mercury Madness Award, Bernard, Bernardino uh, Ramazzini Award, John F. Goldsmith Award, etc. Scientist Philippe, the audience is eager to hear from you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madvi. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I hope that um, you can hear me, number one, and perhaps you can also see me um, because I think you have to click uh, sort of on, on the top in the middle and then ask to view who's talking and uh, perhaps that's going to work shortly. It doesn't work for me though, but uh, anyway, I wanted to emphasize um, four different words in regard to the PFASs. I've done research on the, the PFAS um, for about 15 years, and uh, I have learned four things, four words that I want to share with you. And, and, and those words are crucial because uh, they indicate that we have really made a mistake. So the first word is this, it's persistence. What I'm talking about here is what Madhvi said, these are the forever chemicals. They are persistent, that is, they don't break down. The, the second word that I learned is this one here, secrecy. Because those chemicals were developed uh, over in the previous century and nothing came out to the public. We were not told. I, as a scientist, thought that these compounds were simply innocuous and, and not toxic at all. We learned only during the last 15 or 20 years. The third word is this. Um, these compounds in particular harm children because children are born on this planet full of PFASs. There are no children who are born without PFASs in, in the body. They are all born with these chemicals. And um, here's the fourth word that I wanted to share with you, namely vulnerability. And it's particular the, uh, the fetus and uh, the young child who is vulnerable to, to these compounds. And that's why I think it's very appropriate that um, Matvi is spurheading uh, this seminar, but that, that she's also, um, she's also uh, heading the uh, eco-ethics uh, movement so that uh, she's trying to make us understand that we have to work together to change the course of humanity on this planet. I understand that uh, a video that I have recorded with some uh, recent uh, research findings uh, will be shown now. So I'll be back later, but thank you for being part of this and congratulations to you, Madhvi. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Matvi, and uh, hello, Lalitha. I'm very pleased to be here with you, uh, although only visually, virtually, 
Um, I'm Philippe Grandchamp. I'm a uh, physician. I'm a professor of environmental medicine at the University of Southern Denmark, and I'm also an adjunct professor at Harvard University. I'm, I'm very pleased that uh, we now have an awareness month uh, for PFAS pollution impact and that you're having this seminar on um, that occasion with the ecoethics um, supporters. Uh, and I want to share with you a few thoughts uh, that I have in, in regard to uh, the PFASs and why your efforts are so important. So let, let me show you a couple of slides uh, and um, I will uh, explain to you uh, some some details. Now, PFAS exposures um, may reach all of us. In fact, we all have these compounds in our bodies. I have looked at thousands and thousands of blood samples. I've never met one from any country that did not contain PFASs. So uh, we're all exposed, including those who are still in their mother's womb and those who are 10 years old, like you, Matt. So um, the concern is uh, <laughs> what, what happens uh, early in life. Uh, and um, as it says here, what happens in the womb lasts a lifetime. And, and certainly what happens is that these compounds can affect the programming of our organ development. And uh, that can then lead to um, functional uh, changes so that the brain, the immune system, uh, the hormonal uh, balance, uh, etc., will not become optimally functioning. And then with time, that can lead to development of disease and, and degenerative changes. So um, what, what we're doing uh, is essentially uh, to try to assess the risks. And we have not been very successful doing that because we're trying to identify what uh, the key outcomes is and um, what other factors may play a role. But um, we have not really locked where we should have locked. And there are several reasons for that that I'll come back to. We also need to look at uh, what is the population at risk. And mainly, we first looked at people exposed at work. And then we looked at the adult population. And it's only recently that we've begun to realize that before people become workers and before they come, become adults, they actually went through some earlier life stages that are much more vulnerable to toxic compounds like the uh, PFASs. So we should actually measure the exposure early in life and perhaps look at what the consequences might be later on. And we've only done that to a very little extent so far. So uh, on the basis of uh, all of that uh, information, we should really figure out, well, how do we deal with this? Can we uh, minimize this pollution and how much? And the fact is that we have been barking up the wrong trees for so many years. And now we're finally realizing uh, where we actually ought to have done something to prevent exposures. And I want to show you a key um, graph uh, that really illustrates what's going on. You know, uh, this is for uh, PFAS, which is the most common of the PFASs. And, and the fact is that we're all born with some PFAS in, in our blood because a mother shares what she has in her body with her fetus. And so we all get born with uh, PFAS in, in the body. But this uh, green line here shows what happens to the infant's blood concentration of PFAS. And you can see it goes up and up and up and up for, for a whole year because this child was breastfed for a year. 
you know, as the loving mother wanted to do because uh, she knows and she's been told by physicians like me that mother's milk is the best nutrition and therefore breastfeeding is sacred. But PFAS is are finding their way. They are really obnoxious chemicals. They're finding their way into human milk, which means that the breastfed child will have a greater and greater uh, exposure to these compounds during the full duration of uh, breastfeeding. This dotted line here shows uh, the, the concentration in a child that has not been uh, breastfed. So you can see there's a substantial uh, difference. Uh, and for comparison, this is for, for another of the PFASs. You can see here the, the peak that the child gets from breastfeeding, and then it does drop down over several years. And you can see adults, the average adult with a background exposure will never reach that sort of a peak exposure. And therefore, to look for adverse health effects uh, based on what the exposures might be later on is not going to be very informative. But this is what we've done. Let me then um, show you um, uh, our interest in vaccinations, um, which uh, is associated with recommendations from the World Health Organization. They say, well, if you're interested in seeing whether the immune system functions the way it should, or if it doesn't, you should really look at how well we respond to vaccinations. And uh, actually, this syringe is much too big. This, this is not a vaccination syringe. So, so Matvi, relax, uh, take your vaccinations. Uh, the, the needle is very small and, and the syringe is nothing to worry about. But anyway, when we vaccinate our children, we are counting on the immune system producing antibodies so that the child is protected against these diseases uh, later on due to the pro uh, protective antibodies. And we have actually looked at antibody concentrations in children, in vaccinated children, um, who were exposed uh, at different levels of uh, PFASs. And I just wanted to show you uh, the uh, results for uh, diphtheria. And um, the uh, conclusion of this is for every time you double the exposure to the PFAS, you lose 50% of the antibody concentration. And, and this is clearly a very substantial effect on the adverse effect on the immune system, something that you might see with radioactive radiation or uh, some cancer drugs. And this is actually what's in the environment and that we get exposed to every day. And it's called PFAS. So we are exposing ourselves and our children and kids uh, who are age 10 or at any other age, they're exposed to these compounds every day. How come it took so long to discover? Well, it was actually known already uh, something like 44 years ago when one of the companies that have been producing these compounds for, for decades they actually did a study in monkeys and showed that um, PFASs are very toxic to the immune system. But this information and the information from 1992 that they could see immunological changes in the workers, those results were kept secret. We were not told until early this millennium. So it was kept secret for more than two decades. And so only after that, we began to look, oh my God, this could be toxic to the immune system. And that's when we uh, stumbled over the results in regard to the uh, vaccine antibody uh, production. 
So uh, when you see the uh, uh, people wearing a T-shirt like this, um, this woman, uh, this young woman is uh, saying, I don't want to be forced to be vaccinated. Uh, fair enough, but, but uh, <laughs> uh, there is a problem here that if she does get infected, she may not have an optimally functioning immune system to protect her. And so the vaccine is better. And maybe if her immune system is kind of depressed, she may actually need an extra vaccination to be better protected against, in this case, COVID-19, but uh, in regard to infectious diseases um, in the more general sense. So um, my, my point is essentially that environmental justice should start already before we're born. We need to protect the most vulnerable people in the population. And that's children uh, age 10 or any other uh, uh, age. And it's certainly also the fetus. So, um, Madri, I, um, I recognize your contribution and I commend your uh, efforts. I, I think you're doing a great job. And I'm so happy that the um, uh, governor agreed uh, to make March the Awareness Month for uh, PFAS pollution impact. Um, so I, I wanted to end by quoting um, a Danish, you know, I'm a Dane, so um, a Danish philosopher uh, who said, and I think this uh, applies very much to, to you, Madri, uh, that uh, to dare is to lose one's footing momentarily, but not to dare is to lose oneself. And you are daring and you have done something very courageous and I admire you for that. And so um, I'm sending you my, my best wishes uh, and uh, I hope that uh, uh, we will meet again sometime and uh, I, I hope that your campaign will be a great success. Thank you very much for um, asking me to contribute to your seminar. Thank you, scientist Philippe. I have no words to express my feelings. Hey audience, what do you think? Who is in for an environmental climate justice fight with me?